uh, I need this one. All right. Okay. Thank you, Shamik, for uh, this introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Tommaso, Roma, where is Roma? Oh yes, he's there. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure to to be here to stay with you to discuss the ideas. Very nice conference. I enjoy a lot. Uh, I'm going to talk about long-range interaction in 3D live atomic systems, but this is just part of my talk. I also would like to share with you some results I have with single atoms where there is no long-range interactions. But uh, I like these results, so it's very new results, and I would like to, to share with you. Uh, I also would like to thank the support I have for my research from FAPESP, uh, State Agency in Sao Paulo, CNPq, CAPS, and the National Institute for Science and Technology for Quantum Information, the INCT for Quantum Information in Brazil. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, really hard to get money in Brazil, unfortunately. Uh, we are suffering some problems, some uh, size in Brazil is suffering a little bit, but we still have some, some money, fortunately. Uh, my talk, I divided basically in three parts. I uh, would like to do a basic introduction of EIT and motivations. We saw many talks already that people use EIT, many applications, very nice applications, in fact. So perhaps I didn't, I didn't need to explain too much about EIT, but I will do because I need the, the interference effect behind EIT to explain some results I have. And mainly this one, continuous generation of quantum light in a single atom, single atom cavity system. So I'd like to discuss with you these results I have. It's a very new result. It was submitted to publication last month. Last month. So, uh, but there is nothing to do with long-range interaction in this first part of the talk. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the last part of the talk, long-range interaction in three-level atomic systems. Then I would like to, to see the question is how the EIT is, is affected by the long-range interaction. This is a hard work. Fortunately, I have two good people working with me, Carlos and Murilo. They did the calculations, all the simulations, and uh, the calculations are really hard. But fortunately, I have some previous uh, preliminary results I'd like to discuss with you to get some feedback to discuss these ideas. Uh, let's start with the basic concepts uh, behind EIT. We have basically uh, an atomic ensemble, then we send light two fields into this atomic sample here. One we call probe field, and another one is the control field. The name is control because we can control the optical properties of the atomic ensemble. Just tuning the intensity or the frequency of this control field, we can choose, we can, we can adjust the optical properties of the atomic ensemble. So basically we have in this system uh, three level atoms, in this case in a lambda configuration, but as you said, uh, as you saw before, it's also possible to, to investigate, to study EIT in other schemes of levels, for example in ladder schemes, as George told was before. Uh, but in this case, I'm explaining you, uh, in this, I'm considering this lambda scheme. In this lambda scheme, we have basically the probe field, this field we probe the atomic system here with a hub frequency omega p, capital omega p, and there is a determinant between the one and three transition delta p between the probe field and the atomic system. And we also considering consider this couple field here, the control field. The hub frequency of, of the co control field is capital omega c, and there is also a possible determinant here between the the control field and the atomic system. So, uh, in this system, it's quite simple to, to investigate, to study the properties of the system because it's just a three by three system. So we can easily diagonalize the system to find the eigenstates. And there is one which is very important for us, which is the dark state. The, dark the orange of the uh, uh, transparency windows in these experiments relies on this state because in this case, as the name says, dark state, there is no interaction with the light fields. So if the system is preparing that state, 
we will not see any interaction between the fields and the, and the atomic system. So the, this field will, will, will not be absorbed, sorry. This probe field would not be absorbed by the atomic system if the atomic system is prepared in this state, which is a superposition of the two ground states one and two. In this case, we have the omega C one minus omega P two, which means that if we have a very strong co control field here, the dark state is basically the state one of the system, right? Uh, the origin of the AT relies on an interference effect, a quantum interference effect. Probably most of you all know, but it's very useful to, to see this. Uh, to understand this interference between different absor absorption pathways, it's very useful to rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the dressed basis of the control field, which is the states plus and minus, which is just one plus two or one minus two. So in terms of these new states, these dressed states, we can see that if the control field, the happy frequency of the control field is too strong, I mean, much stronger than the, the K rate of the excited state three, in such a way that the splitting of the levels plus and minus is bigger than the line width of the excited state, then we have two ways of excitations of excitation of the atom of the atomic system here. The probe field can excite the state minus, either the state minus or the state plus, completely independently. So we can uh, uh, excite the system in a very well defined way. So there is no way of interfering, interference in this case. This is the regime we call Alter Towns regime because we have just a split of levels. We have transpires in this case, but the optical properties of the system is not dramatically changed as in the next case, because in the next case, we assume that the control field, the happy frequency of the control field is not so strong. So it's much stronger than the probe field, but not so strong as the decay rate of the excited state. So in this case, uh, both levels, the dressed levels, plus and minus, will rely in between the, inside the line width of the excited state. So in this case, if you probe the system with a laser field driving the transition from one to three, we have two pathways of excitation here, but both inside the line width of the excited state. In this case, these two pathways are indistinguishable, and then we expect some interference. And in fact, the interference happens in this case, and then the absorption of the system is destroyed. So, as you can see here, the normalized absorption, we see that on resonance, when we drive this system exactly on resonance, we do not see any absorption of the system. One important parameter we have in, the, in this kind of experiment is just the phasing of the ground state two. If the dephasing is zero, we have a perfect superposition of the ground states so we have uh, the dark state is preserved. We have uh, all the time the, the dark state there. But if this dephase is not zero, this dephase can destroy the dark state. And when we destroy the dark state, we do not have interference anymore because the pathways are distinguishable in this case. And then the absorption, which would be zero before, for uh, st strong dephasing, we have basically uh, we do not have interference anymore, and then the uh, EIT disappears, right? Uh, there are many applications of EIT. Fortunately, we saw many of them during this conference so far. Uh, the previous talk, we saw many applications, how to use optical bistability based on EIT to control, to detect fields, and so on. Uh, one of the most famous applications was the slow light. Probably most of you knows, know. The group velocity of a pulse of light can be strongly reduced. We can calculate the group velocity, and we see that it's proportional to the Hubble frequency of the control field. If this Hubble frequency of the control field is very small, the group velocity can be really small. So as people already did many experiments, for example, to, to reduce the light speed up to 70 meters per second. If you are in the outer towns regime, this guy would be so strong, so the happy frequency of the control field 
would be strong, and then we, we would not be possible to reduce the group velocity to so slow velocities. And then we can, it's hard to use for quantum memories, for example, but we can do. Uh, optical memories, there are many experiments people do optical memories, either in atomic ensembles or in, with many atoms or just with single atoms in optical cavities. So we can do quantum memory, we can store informa quantum information, not only classical information, but also quantum information in the atomic system or in a, just a single atom. The problem here is deficiency. In all the case, deficiency is the main problem here. And I'm going to discuss this a little bit more later. Uh, other applications. As George told us, that it's possible to use a sensor. There are other post examples of sensors in the literature. There are many others. I, I'm showing you just a few of them just to, to emphasize the importance of this EIT. Uh, ground state cooling. It's possible. Uh, Giovanna Mori, is she here? <laughs> yes, your works. <laughs> Very nice works. Uh, you can do, you can cool the system even below the, uh, for really cold system to, to get really cold temperatures using IT. Uh, I learned that last Monday by talk by Professor Miko that it's possible to use to prepare cold molecules, very nice talk. Thank you very much for the information. <laughs> and many others. So uh, I personally have been working with single atoms in cavities. I have been studying uh, EIT with single atoms in optical cavities. And I did some works with these subjects so far. For example, single atom optical transistor in optical cavities. This is a nice experiment many years ago. Uh, it's possible to control this op uh, the statistical properties of the light when you use EIT. For example, just changing the intensity of the control laser, we can choose the kind of statistics we have in the output of this cavity. So we can have either a very bunched or very anti-bunched field outside, uh, going out of the cavity here, just by changing the intensity of the control field here. Uh, there is another paper we published uh, this year uh, in a system similar to this one. We can study multi photon EIT. So in the system, you can permit the transmission of a single photon, but you cannot permit the transmission of two photons, for example. This can be used for, for quantum, uh, quantum filters, for example. You can select the transmission of photons. Instead of passing just one, pass two or less, we can choose this. We can do arbitrary rotations in Fox space. So given a cavity mode, a bosonic field, we can ap apply this, this theory to, to promote trans uh, rotations, arbitrary rotations between zero and one photon. For example, starting from zero photons, we can go to a perfect superposition of zero and one and back, and so on. So in a coherent way. We showed this in this paper here. But what I'd like to show you today is not this, but it's very connected to these previous works, is the, this paper here. We, it's on archive. Uh, we study the generation of quantum light from a single atom, which is always in the ground state. So we use this system again. So basically, one atom trapped inside an optical cavity. And in this case, we have the control field but you do not have this probe field. And we added a second laser here. So the system is basically this one. We have the atom, again, in a three-level system, coupled to the cavity mode. In this case, the one to three transition is coupled to the cavity mode. We also have the control field driving the transition from two to three. And in this case, we add the second field here. We are calling this field as couple, coupling field because it couples the two ground states of the system. So ba it's basically the same system I have been studying for, for the last 10 years, but the difference here is that we coupled a second laser here. What this new field can bring to us, what the new information this field can bring to us. To understand this, it's very useful to rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the basis of plus and minus, in this case, Pay attention because the dressed state here is the dressed state of the coupling field. So 
plus and minus is a are a superposition of one and two ground states only. Before it was the superposition of two and three, now the superposition of one and two only. So in this case, what appears here? If we have uh, if the coupling field, this happy frequency omega one two, is very strong, we will have a very strong splitting of levels, and then the field, the coupling of the atom with the cavity mode will not be resonant anymore, and the coupling between the atom and the control field is not be is not going to be resonant anymore, also. But if this guy is very weak, what means? If the split of these two levels are very small, we end up have perfect, almost perfect resonant process here. But in this case, we will have two perfect lambda systems. In lambda systems, we expect some interference because we have the exact the same configuration we have in the EHE experiment. But in this case, we have two lambda systems happening, happening simultaneously. So in this case, uh, sorry, the Hamiltonian, we can here write the Hamiltonian of this in, in terms of this new basis. And then we can calculate the angle state of the system. When this coupling field here is small or negligible, we can calculate the eigen states of this, this system, which is quite easy. And we have two classes of eigen states. The first is the dark states, again, for the atom, atom capped system. And the first dark state is the one zero, which, which means the atom is in the state one and there is no fault inside the cavity. But there is also other excited dark, dark states here, which has more photons. For example, here, it's a superposition of atom in the state one and any photons in the cavity plus the atom in the state two and any minus, minus one photon in the cavity. We also have the bright states. So you can here write the Hamiltonian in terms of this uh, in terms of these states. So in terms of the bright states in, in terms of the dark states. And in this limit, when the coupling between the atom and the cavity mode is too strong, in this case much stronger than the the coupling field and, and the control field omega two three, we can derive an effective Hamiltonian. I'm not going to show you all the details of the derivation, it's quite simple. But the important message is we have here an effective Hamiltonian which describes only transition between the dark states. So the bright state is never populated, so the excited state in this case is never populated, but we can do transitions between the zero and one photon dark state, n to n plus one, and so on. So we have uh, many contributions of transitions here, but involving only dark states. So which means that the system is always in a dark state, and this coupling field here, coupling the transition one to two, is continually promoting transitions between these two ground states, and, and between the, the dark states only. So, but what is the interesting point here? For example, if you have this omega two three very small, you can neglect this part of the Hamiltonian, and if you look at this first part, we are promoting transitions from the dark state with zero photons to the dark state with, which has at least one photon. So we are continuously doing transitions between uh, a state with zero photon to a state with uh, one photon inside the cavity. But the cavity has a frequency really different from the other laser fields here. So in somehow, we are injecting photons without exciting the atom, without doing the transition involving the excited state of the atom. So these dark states, uh, with this, we can generate photons inside the cavity. We can generate a photon, a field inside the cavity. And as a collaborator of this work called this process, it's a kind of immaculated photon conception because we are generating photons without the excitation of the system. <laughs> uh, as Another guy told me, well, but we can do this always, because if you drive a system off resonantly, we can also do this. But the difference here is we are always on resonance. All the fields are on resonance. And what is behind this process is a completely interference process due to the EIT interference. Just that. 
So, of course, we can excite seeds, we can inject photons, uh, as in parametric down conversion, for example, we can do generate photons in different frequencies. But in this case, we need an out of resonance processing somehow. But in this case, the, all the fields are on resonance, and we still are injecting photons inside the, in, into the cavity. And as we can see here, uh, sorry, the mean number of photons inside the cavity is quite small, but when we are in the in the strong coupling regime, in this case, G 10 times kappa. Kappa is the decay rate of the cavity. G is the coupling between the atom and the cavity mode. In this case, we have uh, almost the same amount of light when we are in the strong coupling regime or when we are in the weak coupling regime. The weak coupling regime, in this case, we have G equals to 0.5 kappa. But the difference appears in the population of the excited state. In this case, in the strong coupling regime, this population is really negligible, but the population when we are in the weak coupling regime is very, very high. So if you look at the ratio between the mean number of photons inside the cavity and the population of the excited state, in the strong coupling regime, for the parameters we use it here, we achieve the value for 400, but for the uh, weak coupling regime, you have uh, more or less half, so which means that in this case there is a strong population in the excited state, but in the strong complete regime the population is really negligible. So in fact we are generating photons without excited atoms for sure. Uh, we also can see the correlation function to see that in this case we can have a very anti-bunching field when we are in the strong coupling regime. So we are generating a stream of single photons, in fact. So the ratio can be something like 1,000 bigger in the strong coupling regime. Uh, another, uh, if you are able to neglect this part of the Hamiltonian, which is possible when this guy is very small, as I said before, we are doing just transition between the two first dark states. So we have a, um, an effective two-level system. So in this case, this could be used in s even for our quantum information process because we have two, uh, two well-defined states, orthogonal states and so on, and we, you are doing transitions between them, rotations between these two dark states. And this is what we see here. When the happy uh, frequency of the control field is much smaller than the coupling, the atom field coupling. We have basically the populations of the two, the, the, the two first dark states. The population of the other dark states, P2, P3, and, and so on, are really negligible here. If you go to the regime where the, the control field hub frequency is comparable to the atom field coupling, then we can excite other states. So in this case, we do not have a two-level system anymore. Uh, okay. Ah, I, st I still need to comment here. In this case, as we have just a two levels dark state, two level system, we, the atoms are always in the two ground states, one and two, and the cavity has at most one photon. So we have zero and one. So we have basically two by two systems, the cavity and the, the atomic system. And in this case, the dark states are entangled states, and we can calculate the stead state concurrency. In this case, we see that the concurrency, we mean, I mean, concurrency is a degree of a measurement, a measure of the degree of entanglement between, in this case, the atom and the cavity mode. And we see that this is reaches a very, a quite a high value of concurrency, 0.2. Not too high, but it's enough to see that the system is completely entangled and we are in a completely quantum regime in this case. Okay, uh, the other part of the talk, I, s I hope I have time. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Alexei, <laughs> he, he was here. I like this work also. Very nice work because he could show that it's possible to store uh, quantum information or just information in atomic system in many different ways. And uh, one important result 
which is in somehow expected, is the efficiency eta of the memory is inversely proportional to, I mean, one minus the efficiency is inversely proportional to the optical depth of, uh, of the atomic system, as ex is expected somehow. So to have higher efficiencies, we need higher optical depth. And this is what people have been showing in the last years, the last uh, uh, very recently. For example, here in this paper, they show that it's possible to have a very high efficiency, in this case, close to 92%, if you have an optical depth of almost 1,000 in this case. Uh, that is an, but in this case, for 3,000 photons, so we are in a classical, in a, this is just a classical memory. Uh, for a few photons, it's possible to have high efficiency also, but also, again, we need really high optical depth. And in this case, the efficiency was 68%. And a more recent paper, two months ago, which was published this paper, they showed that it's supposed to have a quantum memory with an efficiency around 92%. Uh, but again, the, the optical depth in this case, which was around uh, up to 500 also. So, so in, in every case, we need a really high optical depth. We can do this, increase the size of the sample, or increase the atomic density. But if you increase the atomic density, then we have problems because we have the long-range interaction between the atoms. And then we have to take into account this. In fact, for some quantum computation protocols, the efficiency has to be even higher than 99%. So 92% is really good, but to have some protocols for quantum information, we need even higher. So even higher means that we need even higher optical depth or even higher densities. But in this case, what happens with the long-range interactions? What is the influence of the long-range interactions in these systems? This is the question we are addressing. As I said before, hopefully I have Murilo and Carlos here. And they did this, these calculations, and they derived the equations to, to understand how the long-range interaction affects the EIT. So we have some results here. Uh, we consider uh, N3-level atoms interact with a scalar field. So we are in the scalar model uh, Hamiltonian. So we take into account the interaction of the atoms with the vacuum modes. So this is the Hamiltonian for the vacuum modes. We have also the, the Hamiltonian, which describes the interaction between the atoms and the probe and control fields. And we also consider here the interaction between the atoms and the vacuum mode. So to this term is responsible to derive the spontaneous emission of the system and also the vacuum-mediated interaction between the, the atoms. So if you try to solve this system, of course, you have to do many approximations, Markov approximation, rotation wave approximation. We have to trace over the vac vacuum modes, variables. And then we end up with a system of equation which is three to the power of n, so couple of the equations. Of course, we cannot solve this problem numerically or uh, analytically. It's really hard. Then we have to do some approximation. The next approximation which allows us to solve this problem is the mean field approximation, where we neglect the atom-atom correlations. The quantum aspects of each atom is, is still preserved, but the quantum correlation between different atoms is neglected when we do this approximation. And in this case, we end up with a 6n coupled nonlinear differential equations, which is something like that. <laughs> I just put here just to show that uh, this is the last part of almost 30 pages of calculations, really long calculations. But uh, even these equations are not so easy to, to solve. But we can do another approximation, which is valid when we are in the EIT regime. Because in the EIT regime, we have the control field much stronger than the probe field. In this case, most of the population goes to the stage one, and then we can assume that all the atoms are more or less in the stage one, and the populations in the other states are close to zero. In this case, which is the linear model, so we are doing many, many, many approximations until to, to reach this point, and then we have this more simple system of equations, 
which has some parts here, which are derived from first principles by Murillo and Carlos. We have here the interaction between different atoms. So we have the interaction between the atom J and all the other atoms mediated by the, the this function here, which is here, which depends on the distance between the atoms. So, and then we can solve these equations. And still, in fact, we can also solve this one. And depending on the problem, we have to solve this one when we are in the regime where, where these approximations are not valid. Okay, we have to solve those equations. But solving these equations, you can see, for example, uh, only for almost 2,000 atoms, it's really hard to solve for more than this, we can see that depending on the density of the system, we have uh, different transmissions here. This is in somehow expected because if you have a very dense si atomic system, all the light will be absorbed and then we do not have almost transmitted light. But when we are in a very low density regime, basically they feel path through the atomic system without being absorbed. Uh, but the most interesting point is when we change the control field, the intensity of the control field appears something in interesting for us, which is in somehow we are killing, destroying the interference, because in this, when the control field is not so strong, uh, the excitation of the system is not so, so high, I mean, the population, the excitation of the system can be even higher. In this case, the dark state will be a superposition of one and two, not only one, but it, we have this superposition because in this case, for a small control field, this, these two guys are comparable. And in this case, the incoherent coupling between the different atoms is important. And in this case, destroys the interference between the system. This is, is somehow expected because we have an incoherent process induced by the vacuum. So the effective interaction between the atoms is an incoherent process. Incoherent process destroys the dark state. So this is expected somehow. But here we could show that, in fact, this, this, this is an important effect. It destroys the, the, the dark state. And this will be even more important for quantum memories, because in quantum memories, we have to turn off the control field. So we are in the limit where control field goes to zero. So this will be important for quantum memories. But unfortunately, I do not have, we do not have results so far. We are trying to do this calculation to, to switch off and on the control field to see the storage. But we couldn't do it so far. So I have to finish here. Uh, we have derived equations for the motion, equations of motion for the three level atoms with probe and control field. Uh, the derivation of an effective incoherent interaction between the atoms appears clearly in the equations. And we have shown that long range interactions destroy the transparency window. So this probably will affect a lot the quantum memory. So, but we have to investigate this yet. We didn't do it yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, uh, quantum memory. Uh, the, the problem to solve this, this system is basically numerical because the equations are, we have many equations, coupled equations, nonlinear equations, and this does not allow us to solve two big systems, large systems as you want. This is a problem. But we perhaps we have a solution for this, for this problem because we have another work, but in this case, uh, it was done by Carlos together with Roman and uh, Francisco de Nilson, a professor in Federal University. And Carlos is going to, to give a talk exactly about this work because in this paper, applying renormalization technique, perturbation theory, we can find some analytical solution for this kind of problems. For, for the nonlinear equations, we can find some analytical solutions that could be useful, very useful for our problem. But the derivation of the equations is too, too hard. We, we, unfortunately, we needed a lot of time to derive the, those equations in this case. But in the near future, we hope that we can apply this technique that Carl is going to explain to us in the afternoon to solve this problem. So with this, I conclude. I have to thank the collaborators of the first paper, the first work, Nico, Christopher, and Boy, and Gerhard from Max Planck, and the long-range interactions, Murilo and Carlos, and that's it.
Sorry for the day. Spend more time than, than I have. Thank you, Thank you very much yeah. for the talk. So if you have question, maybe some two urgent questions. Next. Okay, there is one.